So I want to thank the um, library for inviting me here today. It's such an honor to be part of the Carol Weinstein author series. And I want to thank you all for coming out uh, and letting me share some ideas about the middle of somewhere with you. Um, so let me see. I hope I can use this well. OK, the cover. Um, this may be one of the only books where the art came first and the writing illustrates the art. Um, so the inception of the book was an art project, Notes on the State of Virginia. In 2011, I got an idea that I wanted to do something big. I, I mean, I'd been a studio artist for three decades. I wanted to do something that would take me different, different places. I'd meet people. I'd do research. I'd sketch. I'd come back to the studio. And it would be ongoing. Never in 2011 did I think that in 2023 I'd still be talking about it. But I'm thrilled. Um, so uh, I started, th this is the eventual catalog for the series. Um, just to show you, this is kind of indulgent, I know, but um, just to show you, this is my uh, a photograph of two of my uh, notebooks uh, uh, pages from my title ideas. It has, I counted, 52 pages, and they're all just scribbled, scribbled, scribbled. And you can see, it, this is a mimeograph sheet to show you how old that is, <laughs> like early 90s. And there's notes on the state of Virginia written right there. If, if it has a check on it, I've used it for a title. But I, then later, it's, it's over here, notes on the state of Virginia. I do that all the time. I, I don't remember. I've written something. And it's under Farrell and Getty and, bet and between Einstein and Tom Petty. And I thought Jefferson is between those three is kind of an odd combination. Um, but, but I had that idea for a long time. Um, and so I was going to do this project. And I was going to travel throughout the whole state. And um, of course, Notes on the State of Virginia is Thomas Jefferson's only book. And uh, I was going to update it. I'm, I was going to not, many people say I followed in his footsteps. I took the book and used it as a springboard to say, how can I update it to be a, a Virginia portrait now in, from a woman and an artist's point of view? So that was my goal. And this is, this is one of those things where, um, you know, like the, the five geographic regions of Virginia, I was going to cover them all, you know. Sounds kind of boring, but it, it actually is kind of amazing how varied Virginia was. And when I was choosing the sites, I wanted to represent the coastal region, the Piedmont, the Blue Ridge, the Valley Ridge, Valley and Ridge, and Appalachian Plateau. But also, so every thing, you know, I had to have it somewhat equally represented. But really, I wanted to put my feet in a swamp, and I wanted to go out in the morning under pines and see if I could see the red cockaded woodpecker. Or I wanted to, to um, meet somebody, uh, meet a farmer or, an, or a law, uh, fisherman out in the eastern shore. So that, I, you know, I really wanted to, to find out what these habitats were like and who were the kind of people who know about those habitats. So I started out with a, a topographical map. This is Charlottesville, and so I was going to go to Monticello, so I would get a USGS topo map before I left. But they would also serve as the foundation or part of the, or the assemblage that would follow once I got back home. Uh, you know, I love these maps. You know, if, if, you, if I don't have an enlargement, but you, you know the contour lines. They show the, uh, the mountains, the, the hills, and the valleys. And, and if you've gone through art school and taken art drawing 101, you have to do a contour line drawing, usually of the figure, you know. And, but it's so much like that. It's a contour line drawing of the land. And I love these maps. Um, maps make me feel like going somewhere. And I say this in the preface, that 
when I look at Google of Earth, and you know, you zoom in, and it's all pretty amazing, but it's like, okay, technology, it's amazing, but I don't really want to go there then. There's something kind of beckoning about a map. Um, so, to start my pr trip, I kayaked. Um, this is in Dragon Run. And I drew in every place. This is Poplar Forest, Jefferson's retreat, and where he wrote most of the notes in the state of Virginia. Not in that house, but um, that was built later. And, and I'm drawing a, a mulberry leaf. Uh, you can see the mulberries are falling on the table. And the, that is mulberry streaked, and that's probably the earth streaked um, that's around it. I didn't end up using that in assemblage, and I point that out because I collected so much. In a way, I was doing gathering trips. I didn't know what I would use. I didn't know what the assemblage would look like before I did it, before I went back. I also didn't know I was going to be writing a book. So all this research and gathering turned out to be very important eventually. And I met such marvelous people. This is Pat Bradowski. I wish I could show you everyone I met and all the guides and the experts. And, but I just chose this one because I love the idea of the carrots, the drawing of the carrots. And I'm holding the carrots looking like um, Miss Monticello or something like that. <laughs> Um, <laughs> and Pat Brodowski was the head gardener who, when I told her what project I was doing, she starts to say, oh, here, have this, take this, take this. And I was like full of plants and it was very special. That's, that's my definition of being have very special. And I'm jumping ahead a little bit here because I wanted to show you where the carrots turned up. So these were all, all, the, all the things that she pulled up went into this, this uh, profile of Jefferson. And there I am on the eastern shore. Um, there are a few mosquitoes on the eastern shore. <laughs> um, so I, I just didn't want you to all thinking this was just, you know, a, a, a skip in the field, woods. Or, um, and I'm drawing fiddler crabs. and. Um, it, it, again, it was an amazing experience going out there and seeing them coming up and going, you know, when the tide came up and down. And, and Barry Truitt, who knew all about them, would, he would tell me about what was going on. We went out and saw the, the landscape and the, and the seascape. And I brought a lot back. Now, <laughs> um, at one point in the chapter on the road, I talk about my cabinet, my car being like a cabinet of curiosities. It was really packed full of stuff and collections and and gatherings from every place and my sketchbook, of course. And um, then I would take it all into my studio, which at the time was downtown Bristol, Virginia, and. Um, start making an assemblage, um, try, thinking about what was the dominant impression I had of that particular place. Um, and it wasn't always clear to me until I started working. I think that's true for all artists or in, in many genres. Is you have to be working to find the way to do it. Um, and this picture, of I'm painting the Chesapeake Bay on a piece of plexiglass, which will go over the map. The map happens to be all blue because it's the water. Um, but it, the pieces are very, very layered, maybe um, two inches deep. Um, so they're on different layers and different materials. And this one I, I put there just, just to give you a good sense of the map, the plants, painting, drawing, um, sketchbook pa pages are pr printed on mylar. So you get the map showing through. And that also creates that layering effect. So when I was uh, in early 2013, um, when I was finished traveling, finished doing the work, I started to exhibit it. There were 26 pieces, 
and they represented a many, many different areas um, of the state. And uh, when I look at that, I think, wow, that, that is actually from one of the exhibits. Um, they made that to make a key to, it was very hard to tell people. I had, I usually have a little bit too much information, but you know, this was from there, and this is the materials and everything, and so it, this helped telling people what they, what each piece was from, where, where each piece was from, and that was uh, one of the installations. Well, when I was driving home from the Taubman Museum, where it began, where the first because the show then also traveled the state. So I did like two, two circles of the state. Um, and uh, I was driving home and I was thinking, boy, you know, I'm pleased with the, the assemblages, but it really doesn't show the backstories, all the people I met, all the, all the stories, you know, as you said, um, and the funny things and the disturbing things. And, you know, all the, all the characters, all the, creatures, all the um, experiences I had, and I thought, hmm, I wonder if I could write a book. <laughs> now, I, I, to, to be honest, I had written art reviews before, and I always have kept what I consider um, a journal that is more like um, refined essays. When I found out that Thoreau's journal was like that, I felt sort of exonerated, because I literally, I write something down and then I work it, uh, it just pleases me. It, I say in the preface, to make a short thought into a long thought is what I'm after because it's that, you know, you, you, you think of something and then you want to say, but is, what do I really mean? What is that? What, you know, th there's a, actually a, a place in a chapter called uh, Coal Tattoo, which I'm not reading here tonight, but in Coal Tattoo, I see this, this logo of a skull with pickaxes, and I can't figure out why people, why coal miners feel such a, a, a loyalty to coal. And then, so I never, but when I was writing it, and I asked a friend whose father was a coal miner, only through writing it and thinking of it, making that short thought into a long thought, I realized the certain things that my father had said from being a combat soldier in World War II were true, that you get so close to the people you're working with and you care so much about them that, that, the, that the, in, this, in the coal mine, those people that might have died with you down there, you care about them more than anything else. And so it, it creates this bond. So what I'm getting at is that by writing, you get to more interesting, more developed thought just through that process. Um, okay, so, wait. Okay, so I'm writing, I want to write this book, but it's now sometimes two years after I've been there, and I, I think, well, what am I going to do? You know, how am I going to remember everything? Well, Fortunately, in my sketchbooks, I'd kept a lot of notes. In fact, um, Bobby Klontz, who is in the audience here, might rec r recognize this. I'm, he's the steward of Piney Grove. He's in the audience, and I'm talking about what he's telling me. Right, in that I didn't know he'd be here. <laughs> so um, yeah, so I'm, I'm telling him. I, I'm I'm relating what's going on. In, in these on these pages, so when I started to write the book, I put my sketchbooks, the maps, my notes, the assemblage around me just to to uh, stimulate my my imagination and my memory, and it became this book. I mean, after writing it on by hand on legal papers and putting it in the computer and rewriting and rewriting and taking out and putting in, it takes a while to get it not just, you know, um, a rough draft, but to have it, have it enjoyable and for somebody else to read. I was always thinking that I wanted to be very um, welcoming <laughs> to the reader, very, like, you're coming along with me. Aren't you? So this is um, the layout. The assemblage is on the left. 
And the place in Virginia is marked on the, on the silhouette of Virginia with a little star-like symbol. Um, I felt so uh, lucky to have found this quote by Wendell Berry. Actually, I had read it before. And like I keep a title notebook, I also keep a quote notebook. And I'd written it down. And it says, um, what you are doing is exploring. You are undertaking the first experience, not of the place, but of yourself in that place. Um, and it, it absolutely defines what I feel is important about traveling. It's not that you're discovering something new or that you are going to learn all the facts, but you're discovering how you feel about this place. Now, um, it, the book is not in any way a travel guide to Virginia, like somebody would get it and say, this is where we're going to go. But it conveys my, what I would call my travel ethos. And um, let me read you a little section from the preface about my ideas about travel. I confess that no matter how much planning I did, I usually strayed off course once at the site. I did, or rather I do, get sidetracked by design. When actually face to face with an orange-headed skink before it dashes off, or after intently listening to an expert guide, I follow the thrall of the moment, which may mean physical wandering or may mean following my internal meditations. In other words, I daydream. But that said, the distinction between ordinary daydreaming and what I call focused daydreaming is crucial. I know it's an oxymoron, but I claim focused daydreaming is the secret to traveling. Be present, yet also allow associations or imaginative flights to flow. Say I'm rocking in a motorboat off the eastern shore, and marine biologist Barry Truitt has just described the, the island before us, when my mind conjures a scene or a whole life or th on that little plot of sea-bound land. I miss a few particulars, but in the, the daydream, I enter my surroundings viscerally. I knit fact with feeling, and it connects me more intimately with a patch of earth, and thus becomes more memorable. So. In my travel guide, I would say, absorb the facts, listen to people, read the books, and then when you're out there, let that flow. Don't think about the list on the refrigerator or you know something else somebody said on the phone the other day. That's, that's distraction. But if you enter a place and, and then start to imagine it or start to uh, think of it in terms of yourself and your, yourself in the place, I think that's the best way to travel. So, so this is the first assemblage that I'd like to talk about. Um, it's called Bridge, but the but the um, the chapter is called the Dinosaur and the Bridge, and that happened a few times when I changed the chapter name because the chapter started to take a different shape, a different emphasis. Um, and it's, of course, the natural bridge, which is uh, something that I actually had never seen before this trip. I thought, oh, it's still touristy. I don't want to go there. <laughs> and actually, I have an interesting feeling about so-called touristy places now, because right at the beginning when I go to Monticello, I say, what was I thinking? I'm going to do an artwork about this. you know. But you can. You can have your own interesting thoughts anywhere. You just have to know how to control your brain. <laughs> Which is, you know, and, <laughs> that's not an easy thing, you know, getting irritated by buses or whatever. But things, but even a touristy place is a reason why people go there, you know. Um, so um, why do I call, uh, they call the chapter The Dinosaur and the Bridge, because this is the first thing I saw at the at the, at the visitor center. And I said um, to the gardener that was clipping rocks, was, what does a dinosaur-riding cowboy have to do with a rock bridge? 
Beats me, he paused, scratching the back of his gritty neck as he stood staring at the anomaly with me. And I write, I confess, the fiberglass dinosaurs that roamed the touristy Wisconsin dells in the 1950s once thrilled me as much as the pristine birches of the North Woods. And what was interesting, again, having this revelation that at time, I, I would have liked this when I was a kid, and I would have seen no difference, like n not made a value different, change, you know, like this is better, this is not better. And I thought that was kind of, kind of interesting because you, you, when you travel, you, you bring your child self along too. Um, but I did finally get to the bridge. And um, I, wanted to write, I wanted to read this part of the chapter because in the book, I try, I, no, I don't try. I do synthesize different subjects, art, history, art history, uh, nature, of course, um, memoir, and any subject, because I feel that they're all bound together. I don't feel that they can be separated. Um, and I felt this for, for, I can remember feeling it in high school. Like, why do we have to have separate subjects? Like, I was reading Thoreau and Rachel Carson, and why couldn't that be in biology and literature and, and have these more fluid? So that's not how I try to write. That's just how I think. So I'm going to read um, part of the chapter of The Dinosaur and the Bridge. You saw the dinosaur. So this is more at the end of the chapter. As I arranged pencils, pens, sharpener, and eraser on the stone, I thought about the legions of artists who had sketched at this very site. And I realized, this may be as close as I'll ever come to being part of an artistic tradition. For more than 200 years, the bridge symbolized wild America, inspiring grand, inspirational landscapes, or souvenir prints for sightseers. I'd once seen an entire exhibition of drawings, etchings, and dramatic paintings of Natural Bridge, and that was only a sliver of images depicting this landmark. As I drew, clouds curtained the sun, turning the limestone cool with streaks of muted browns and grays, but when the sun appeared, it was as if a golden varnish were brushed over the stone. Raw umber turned to burnt umber, yellow ochre now mixed with warm, rich warm grays. During this light show, and by the way, there was a light show at the night, in the night at Natural Bridge that was this really hokey thing and I didn't go. <laughs> uh, so that's a kind of a, a reference to what I did, the light show that I really liked. Um, during this light show, swallows gracefully lunged from the arch and it occurred to me then that Native Americans, early settlers, and Jefferson himself, who owned Natural Bridge at one time, would have witnessed the same bird, I mean genetically related to these before me now. That notion was a seed idea, one that would expand later in my Bristol studio. There I would find the rough-winged swallow on the website of the National Center for Biotechnology print out strings of nucleotides represented by these letters A, T, G, and C, making up its genome, and snip them into long, thin strips of paper. From these DNA sequences, I'd construct my natural bridge. If that seems far from other natural bridge interpretations, good. That's the advantage of an artistic tradition. The viewer's aware of the point of departure. I've often envied those Renaissance artists commissioned to paint the crucifixion. Because when a subject is well known, its subtle and not so subtle differences are clear. Rubin's muscular Jesus, Memling's delicate savior, Grunewald's tortured spirit. So my bridge would connect art and science. Not really so far-fetched, for after all, their origins are intertwined. Think about it. The first people who drew on cave walls created images to pay homage to the animals that filled their dreams and their stomachs, to honor them, but also have control over them. The beginnings of art and science. 
But now here at Natural Bridge, I put some final flex on my ink sketch of the arch, and before packing up, I scraped some fine granules of pigment, Shh, don't tell anybody, um, with my Swiss Army knife, separating their colors into different vials. Those earthy ochre, rust, and grayish brown particles I'd later grind into a powder, mix with watered down matte medium, and layer over a topographic map. And you can see that. And that's why I, I showed the, the detail of that. So I wouldn't be in Richmond and not read the one on the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts. Um, where I, I stopped and at, right before I got here and went to to see some of my favorite pieces. Now they now they're like mine, you know. They're like, hi, <laughs> you know, remember me? <laughs> um, I mean, I'm so close to them. Um, but especially the woodpecker. Um, now I spent about two and a half days at the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts. This chapter in the, in the book was actually about three times as long. And everyone kept telling, Suzanne, um, <clears throat> you have to cut it down. It has to be more like the other chapters. And it's fine. But I just wanted to mention every single artwork. Because what I did is I took my camp stool and my binoculars and my sketchbook and pens and, and paper. I got permission to use pens. And I used it like a, like a habitat, like a safari. And I'd sit down and I'd not only draw animals I saw, but think about what the culture and the artist was saying through it. Is it a hunting scene? Was it reverence? Was it jokey? You know, uh, there were all, the, the, the range was incredible. But um, the, this particular painting, um, that I'm drawing here really, really intrigued me because of the difference between the woodpecker and the very wooden quality of the, the painting of the, the people in the, in the picture. Okay, so let me read you um, what I wrote, a little, a little section. I perched on a canvas sling camp stool, sketching a red-bellied woodpecker, not under a towering oak's cool shade, but within the cool white walls of the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts. And the bird? Since the late 1700s, it's dwelt in an old plantation scene painted by an anonymous 18th century Virginia artist. In this picture, a boy clutches a bow and arrow in his right hand while the woodpecker dangles lifeless from his ruffled cuffed left. The bird's black and white spotted tail and wing feathers and downward curving beak, brilliant red cap and rouge belly blush, bl blush are rendered so beautifully, obviously observed closely and loved. For isn't willingness to spend hours studying and then recording an act of love. But the pasty pale lad is painted only competently. So too his little brother, his African-American nanny nurse, and their little lap dog all appear stiff, wooden, as if painting them were just another job for the artist. It was. There's no mention of the bird in the title. And what does the accompanying label say about the woodpecker? Not one word. As an artist, I know that, that whoever it was, it's anonymous that when they say Payne Limner, he's named after a painting they know of, but they don't know his name. But I can tell that it's, look at the, like the nictating, nictitating membrane over the eye. It's perfectly done. The, the way the feathers are arranged, it's just, I mean, it's, it's good or better than Audubon. So here's how I'm going to rewrite the label. And this is myself in a place. I often rewrite labels. <laughs> in colonial America, limners were artists with little former training who travels from place to place, soliciting commissions, usually portraits. When anonymous, they are often referred to by one of their works, as is the case of the Payne Limner, who roamed the state of Virginia in the late 1700s. 
His proficient painting of the figures and background distinctly contrasts with the skillful touch and intense observation lavished on the red-bellied woodpecker. Perhaps this is a veiled statement about the panes, or upper class in general, or perhaps, or possibly the bird fascinated the artist while ex executing a routine portrait commission. So now for something a little different. I am fascinated by collecting, and um, excavating is, of course, collecting. Uh, so I went to Poplar Forest, and this is a, a plate, uh, pieces of a plate that I made, and I made up the designs on them as well. For instance, it has a DNA double helix around it that wasn't in De Jefferson's kitchen or dining room. That is a, 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 a facsimile of a fork, his fork that they dug up a ruler, and the way it, it's, it, I use um, the clay from the excavation. And those are, are, of course, his eyes from the portrait by Rembrandt Peel. Um, but talking about being sidetracked by design or being focused daydreaming, I want to read you the first part of this chapter. Tucked in my mother's antique glass cabinet, a rose-colored sash lies tenderly folded alongside a photo of my grandmother, Anna Alexander. In the 1918 sepia print, that same sash drapes over her silk recital gown, collar abloom with embroidered blossoms. How strange to gaze at that young woman, her held head tilted demurely, lips pressed into a faint smile, and know she was about to sing her last concert before her fiancé would die in a boating accident on the Kankakee River. Drowned with him, would be this soprano's passion to perform on stage. Her future children would hear only her ironing songs sung while bowed over a daily chore. Strange, too, how that sash floated into my mind hundreds of miles away as I peered into another glass case, this one holding artifacts from the excavation of Thomas Jefferson's retreat, Poplar Forest. I stood with my forehead pressed against the cold pane, and it occurred to me that a museum is but a personal display case multiplied to the nth degree, grand or intimate, both attempt to keep the past on life support. And while we're on that subject, on, on that chapter, um, I, I found that the Jefferson Connection created a, a very interesting historical arc. Now, when you're in Virginia, there's a lot of history, and you can't, you can't ignore it. Um, <clears throat> but having this, this connection, I was constantly aware of it. So let me give you an example um, in the same chapter. And I'm wandering around the, the, the house. A shaft of sunlight slanting through the skylight above reminded me that Jefferson's granddaughters, Ellen and Cornelia, embroidered here under that natural light. <clears throat> Girls in floor-length dresses drawing their needles in and out of circular hoops as they stitched little flower petals, perhaps for the collar of a gown, touching but the thought made me happy to live in an age when I could pull on some jeans to ramble around the surrounding woods, maybe even climb nearby Sharp Top Peak to enjoy its 360 degree views. So um, uh, I was very aware of what I can, I, I am very aware of what I can do now in our world with so much, so many problems in it, there's also so much opportunity and we have to be kind of aware of balancing that. So, um, this is a, um, 
the chapter on uh, Dragon Run. And uh, uh, so I have a lot of dragonflies. That's not why it's named Dragon Run. It's not really known why it's named Dra Dragon Run. But it is the most pristine, one of the most pristine swamplands, wetlands. It's the, the head of, P of the Piankatank River. And um, in, in, it's one of the most pristine wetlands in eastern North America. I mean, who knew? But the, you know how I found that out? I went, I, I had a book by um, former Virginia Poet Laureate Carolyn Kreider Ferranda, and she has a poem called Dragon Run, and I thought, I want to go there. So I, well, long story short, I, met, I contacted Teta Kane, who's a naturalist there, and um, she was a paddle master. Isn't that a wonderful title? I would love to be a paddle master, even though I didn't know how to kayak <laughs> before I went, and I described that. Um, but uh, it was really, really a wonderful uh, trip. We went out at night and saw, we, oh, I don't want to ruin it for you. That's the, one of the great mysteries of in the middle of somewhere that I was just about to spoil. So um, at the beginning, I get to the bed and breakfast. Carolyn and Teta haven't arrived yet. And I can't wait to get out and draw a little bit. So I take my sketchbook out, and there's a little koi pond, and I'm drawing a dragonfly. And all of a sudden, I, I hear this voice. It's Ivan, the bed and breakfast owner. I didn't know anybody did that anymore. And I drop my sketchbook. I'm like, he just yells that from the porch. I didn't do what? I guess sketch, like not, not well, like not, not just take a picture. So um, I I go on and 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 then go on to, the, but I can't I can't help but keep thinking about that and why people why people say that, or maybe why it is something I continue to do. So. Um, I'm going to read you the, at the very end of the chapter, and this is, again, the idea of short thought into long thought. I define what it is that makes me want to sit in front of something and draw it rather than take a picture and go on. I bungled the sketch of one in flight, the dragonfly. The next one fell short, too, as my pen dried out after beginning the wing spread of a blue-eyed swamp darner perched on a cypress knee. Yet I was okay with a few scratchy doodles on my page. That was part of the day, too, which launched me into a reverie. Well, really, more of a delayed response to Ivan's comment the day before. I didn't know anyone did that anymore. And I thought, it's hard to explain why experiencing the world quietly, slowly, unplugged, satisfies me or to express the thrill of feeling my hand trace the fine bristles of a dragonfly's leg, or to put words into how the unhurried process of drawing connects me more viscerally to a place. And could I ever truly describe the spark between a wild animal and myself when eye to eye, whether it's a familiar species or exotic, right outside my studio door or in this wild wetland? So Wunderkammer is also a German word for like cabinet of curiosities or, uh, uh, you know, a wonder, a wonder room. And um, I made these little doors kind of like advent ca calendar. They open up. They, they, are, they are dimensional. You can't really tell from the slide. And in some, there, in this one, there is no salamander in there. It's like, well, you know, not every time you roll over a log do you find a, 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 ju a gem of the earth, right? And um, these are all my sketches, again, printed on clear mylar. I've done a lot of, of salamander drawings. Um, and uh, referencing Wendell Berry's epigraph again, experiencing myself in a landscape, I'm also unselfing. And that's a, a term Iris Murdoch, the British novelist and philosopher uses. And I think that's important too. And that's, when I get, go into a landscape and, and I feel myself in a landscape, I also like to unself. And that is, 
recognize the creatures and the people there who know so much about that habitat and who live, well, let me read it and then you'll know what I think. So this is kind of like my philosophy of life. Um, uh, and uh, I write, mostly I'm alone when salamandering, a word I just added to my computer dictionary. And that's why I call the chapter salamandering rather than the other. Its first meaning, to look for salamanders to seek amphibian jewels of the earth. Second meaning, to get delight from finding a creature that doesn't give a damn about humans. Third meaning, to love that which cannot love you back. My definitions, my priorities. As I sat on a log near the Yanalasi's boulder, this is a, uh, do I have, no I don't, it's a Yanalasi salamander is what, <laughs> um, I'm sure you were all wondering, what kind of salamander is that? Um, I felt good knowing it lived its life away from the stress of inboxes, insurance payments, leaky faucets, and wait, no, it also has stress. Hungry crows picking at the leaf litter for food would be stressful to this small creature. Sharing space with a spiteful centipede might be quite harrowing. Not tunneling down far enough during a cold winter well, that could spell, spell danger for an amphibian. I fidgeted with the red seeds of a Fraser magnolia like worry beads, thinking, what is the difference between a salamander's stress and mine? This, there's a distinction between the vital and the distracting. A salamander's stress is due to essentials of life and death. Can't say the same about many of mine. I resumed my hike and my salamandering. Yana Lassi found I casually turned over a rock or log now and then. I'd come to know, know which were the most promising. Too deep in the ground, nothing. Too lightly set on leaf litter, nothing. Good knowledge. Yet no one will write a new, news story on my accomplishment. What would a world be like? if newspapers slathered with stories of crooked politicians and faraway skirmishes instead featured stories about salamander life and those who seek them. So finally, um, I'd like to end the uh, talk with thoughts about place and about Creatures and drawing, again. And this is a chapter called Life Cycle. And it's uh, really one of the only ones where I'm alone um, and in a, in a cabin. And I have gone through, there's been a storm the night before. And it's kept me up a lot. And the scratching on the roof, metal roof, and the, the thunder and lightning and rain. And I had seen a luna moth on the porch. Of course, I had to get up and go outside and look and watch the storm for a while. Um, and uh, over, under the porch eaves was a luna moth, one of those great big green moths. And by the way, I painted that moth. And the reason I painted him and didn't use a real specimen is because real specimens of luna moths will fade. And um, I didn't want it to fade. But it is a real cocoon a pupa case and the cocoon, so um, just in case you were wondering. Um, so I write the next morning. Morning, dazzling sun slanted through the cabin window, warming my face. As if delivering the news, I'd have a clear day for exploring. While the tea kettle boiled, I, I pulled the chair from the doorknob, dashing out to see the moth. It hadn't budged. What seemed like a gold, ghostly vision the night before made me smile now, for it tucked its head down as if slightly embarrassed to be a lump of white fur wearing fairy wings. As I nudged my index finger against its head, it scuttled on, then froze in a I'm a leaf pose as it rode my finger to the wooden table turned drawing, table, draw, drawing board. A super fine pen. Line felt thick and clumsy, liming those fragile wings, 
Maybe only paint could do their translucence and soft celadon hairs justice. The moth's large yellowish antenna told me it was a male, for those ferny receptors must be long to detect a female's pheromone from miles away. I'd need a pen point the size of an eyelash for those. While I scrawled the little, the little fur, golden furred legs, it occurred to me that every molecule in the moss body came from this very place. The crumbling lime-rich soil, the trickling mountain water, the walnut leaves his larval self once gobbled, all these, for a brief time now, shape-shifted into Actius Luna, a member of the Saturnades, or giant silkworm moths. I gently placed the moths back under the porch eave while I'd explore the ridge. He'd be rested for his expedition after sunset and now for mine. Along the trail, I collected crusty brown seed pods, beetle husks, and a small bit of bone gnawed by squirrels. Fence lizards fled my clomping hiking boots, dashing up rocks or tree trunks. From the tip of a sapling, a chipping sparrow threw back its rusty capped head. Chip, 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 chip. I remembered the red-haired cashier at the nearby marathon station, slouching between rows of rental videos, despairing to his buddy that he had nothing to do, that this place was the middle of nowhere. Are you kidding, I thought, but said nothing, swiping my debit card for gas and coffee. Not his fault, we're taught to think that way. What a privilege it is to be astonished by the living world so that every place becomes the middle of somewhere. Thank you. So if you have questions, we have mics and we can bring them to you. Oh, it, it varies. Like with me and Pat Prodowski, um, we just asked somebody passing by if they would take the picture. Yeah, and sometimes um, somebody, like in my studio when I'm painting, I just said, you know, this could make an interesting picture. Could you, you know, just grab somebody. I meant to say photographs of the moving. <coughs> Did I say that right? Yeah, I, I know yeah. what you meant. Yeah, yeah. the photographs. Yeah, and, and the press decided not to use any of the photographs. It was hard enough to put so many sketches in a book and design it. And each, like, Bobby Klontz is here from, uh, he's a steward of, of Piney Grove, uh, and took me out to see the red cockaded woodpecker. So thank you, Bobby. And I didn't get a picture of him. And I was so mad. It was like, you know, I mean, I have pictures of him, but not me with him, you know? Uh, and so uh, a project I'm doing now, I always make sure that I get a picture of the people I'm working with. You had a question? Well, yes. I first wanted to say that this is an extraordinary book. And thank you. Thank you very much. Thank um, you very much. You take a very unique and uh, new look at the relationship between physical geography and human geography, which is one of my big interest. I'm a historian and a master naturalist and, and a long time outdoorsman. But I wanted to ask you this question. Um, how would an historian build on this? How would an historian move the work that you've done forward from an historical perspective? I mean the actual book or the or the the actual book or the, the um, weaving together of nature and history? What? Well, yes, I guess the, the latter. The latter, yeah. Well, say, you know, uh, say, you know, I go to Appomattox. I, I chose that. Of, I knew I had to do one Civil War battlefield, and I chose that, and I explained that in the chapter, but uh, why I chose that one. But, um, I mean, what about looking at the succession that's going on there? The, the, you know, I remember standing with that gardener. I mean, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, <laughs> got to keep me reined in. Um, 
so we were talking about Appomattox, and I was, ta I was talking to the man who's planting trees there, the, the, work, the employee there. And one thing I don't mention in the chapter is, that he, is he said, you know, this area was so much fields of tobacco and corn and other crops, you could see all the way to the present town of Appomattox at the time of the Civil War, and it's all forested. And I think that's an interesting thing to realize is succession. When I take people out to um, the Jefferson National Forest around my home, where a salamandering chapter takes place, um, I say, you know, this, this whole area was logged once. And they look at it like it's, it's pristine wilderness. And it's not. And I said, you know, the, this trail was a railroad, and the railroad was built so that they could take the logs down. Oh, you know, and so I think that's a way for history and nature to intersect in an interesting way. How we see things differently in the natural world because of their, their, um, the impact that some event has had on it and then it's gone back to nature or been more developed or that kind of thing. Did that answer your question? Is that the, yeah. Any other questions? So this is an art question. Um, okay. The book is lovely. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Um, but this printing on mylar business, what, what is your, I said in one you were painting on it and then you've printed on it. So did you take your sketchbook pictures and like, how did you do that? <laughs> well, I did that, at, at the, the printing of it when it covers the whole map at an architectural um, uh, supply company in town. Um, they have this huge printer and they do these um, high quality prints on mylar, clear mylar for some architectural pur purpose. And um, I should know, but I don't. Um, uh, and so I would have to take just copies of them, just like photocopies or you know, good quality, and p make a paste up. And then they would put it through it. Um, yeah, they would put it through the machine. I, I was never allowed to go back there. So. <laughs> Suzanne, I've come across a book called Nature Fix. Nature uh, Fix. Yeah. I forget who it's written by Florence Williamson or something like that. But she articulates the impact that nature has on us intellectually, physically, creatively, and health wise. What is your life like now after having spent this intense? period of time buried in nature? Um, well, I tell you, um, this whole series was purchased by the University of Virginia, by the way. Um, and so it's now in their collection. And two weeks after they purchased it, I got a call from someone in Abingdon that said, you know, William King Museum of Art is going to become a collecting institution now. We'd like to purchase your, your notes on the state of Virginia. And for the first time in my life, I said, well, sorry, it's sold. <laughs> um, and so she said a few words. Um, and then <laughs> and I um, got a call from the director of the museum about three weeks later, and they sa she said, we, this woman and her, would like to make a proposal to you. Could we come in your office? And so I went in there and said, what would you think of creating a similar series on maps about place for Southwest Virginia and Northeast Tennessee that this museum covers? And I thought, and we will give you a studio and buy the piece af pieces afterwards. So that's what I'm doing now. <laughs> I just went up to see the elk. Um, I'm d working with somebody who's interested in wild, who knows a lot about wild crafting. I, um, in fact, the elk are on an old um, mountaintop removal site that they've made into a meadow, so, which really threw me through a loop. Like, what am I going to do? You know, this is interesting. This is, throws diff it in a different light. Um, and people, I, I, I make a point in one of the chapters that. You know, one person can spill toxic chemicals and another person can uh, uh, help put the muscles back in the, oh, that chapter, muscles back in the river for the rest of his life. You know, people are these, like, always seesawing between these, these 
these destructive and constructive uh, impulses and, and duties and to the earth. And um, so th I am th doing that, but I also keep a sketchbook. I mean, I, ac I actually have one. Um, it's number 55, and this is how big they are. Um, and, you know, um, it's full of stuff. You know, uh, like the, the recently I went out with um, Hila Taylor, who is a Israeli biologist working at Virginia Tech on bat research. And so we went out together and I watched her, I couldn't help her because you have to get rabies shot before, but um, I, I actually, I helped her um, with what I could do these, to band these bats and then do a picture of one. and. So, I mean, it's such an adventure, and it's so good for the soul, because you meet these people. You know, you've got to just shove the news away from you sometimes and just meet people who are alive and intense and excited about the world and the wonder of the world. You really, you really need it. So that's what I'm doing now. And, and so the nature, I can't stay away from it. Thank you for a luminous talk. I can't wait to buy multiple copies of your book. Oh, thank um, you. I have the privilege of working with young people from the University of Richmond, many of whom travel for the first time. Uh -huh. What advice would you give to young travelers who often are acutely aware of themselves in a landscape or a place, but sometimes don't feel like they have the tools to analyze the place around them? Well, the best thing that you can do is show them that an adult cares about what they observe. They, children who get a, eh, you know, or like, oh, what's good, ugh, it kills their curiosity. But if, if they find a caterpillar or a frog or a feather and they show it to you, show more than awe, you know, yes, that's, isn't that beautiful? What could, you know, let's write about that or, or let's make a picture of it or let's look up and see what it is. Um, so that you're showing them that an adult can be interested. And that means the world, that meant the world to me. I mean, I, I was always a little kid like, I don't want to tell anybody that I like these things because they'll tease me. And then I went to a conservation workshop in Southern Illinois and met people, other people who were interested in that. And that would be like what Nature Camp here in, in near Lexington. And um, now in our region, we have the Blue Ridge Discovery Center um, does for children. And I'm sure you have places here. Or uh, even in, in elementary school, I know it's hard with solves and all those things that you have to do. But just to have things that are respected and interested. And they don't have to be the megafauna and the, the gr beautiful so-called that everything can be beautiful. And that's, that's um, a privilege, too. Um, that, when you think it in that way, and you don't have to just see, like, the female cardinal is as beautiful as the male cardinal, you know? And, um, and you look at their little um, nestlings, and, like, only a mother could love that thing. <laughs> it's, it's like this bundle of guts with a big black eye that has an open, but it's beautiful. You've got to really make a distinction between what's pretty and what's beautiful. And when you start to show the children that, um, they get excited, and you have to sympathize with them also not wanting to be teased. Like my grandson recently told me that he didn't want, he calls it his dead bug collection. I mean, like, like he's gonna collect live ones and put them in a case. So we, we collect things, and he said, you know, Grammy, I'm not going to show this to my friends. Why not? Because they might laugh at me. But then at show and tell, somebody else did, and he brought it in, and everybody thought it was cool. So he was, wow, you know, and I knew what they were, you know. <laughs> so it, it, it builds. Jack, two. Yeah. Jack, two. Um, thank you. Sorry, I didn't know who you were until I got here tonight when I was late but I'm glad that I came. Thank um, you. <laughs> I'm, I'm just now kind of like on a nature discovery of my own. But I wanted to, uh, and also props for mentioning Nature Camp um, in Vesuvius. I, I spent a few years there myself on the Garden Club 
scholarship. Oh, um, good. <laughs> but anyway, my question is, I am not in any way an artist. Um, like, I can't hardly even glue a little picture down on a piece of paper. But how would you kind of recommend somebody who's starting to do something like that and doesn't feel like they have any kind of gift or ability with art to, you know, to do it? Just go yeah, it. I, I sometimes you. wish that I brought, uh, I, that I had, when, when I get a question like this, my first sketchbooks. Because they're clumsy drawings and they're all over the place. And I, you know, I'm on 55 now. I, it takes time. You know, you, you, it takes time to draw. And, it's, and so that's one of my answers. But the other answer is you've got to find what you enjoy doing. Um, I always think that, that, that this book, in a way, is saying, um, OK, well, I actually write. At the end of the preface, I'm like a bee, you know, doing a waggle dance, saying, "Now you go find the honey. You go find something that that you can explore and be yourself in that place." Um, and you know, I, I have nothing against. I, I mean, you can photograph, you can write notes. If you photograph, um, think about the photographs. I remember a photographer when I was young. This was in the '60s, saying. Go out with one shot in your camera, one shot, and really think about the composition, really think about what you're doing. And with digital cameras, you know, you can just shoot, 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 shoot and forget about them all. Really think about what a, a specific, you don't have to do just one, but a specific shot, or write a note about it. In my nature drawing classes, I always say, write a question that you have to ask, you're asking in a way yourself, and you go back and you answer it. Like, is this a gray tree? You know, what kind of frog this is this? And I've heard him at night. Is this the same one I'm hearing at night? And then you go back and um, you have a wealth of knowledge on Google. And you can look up sounds and information on them. And then go back out and, again, experience it yourself. The writing, photo photographing, drawing, it doesn't matter how clumsy it is. It doesn't matter, it, you, you always start out at a beginning level and you keep getting better and better. And you, you, you can't get from A to uh, F or to G or whatever without going through all those other phases. And um, a songwriting, music, um, meditating, you know, there's many different ways to create your link and that's how to use your imagination, too. I think we sometimes emphasize imagination like it's wild imagery or something like that. But it also takes imagination to figure out who you are and how you are going to relate to something. And even if that something is something, you, you say, I'm, I'm relating to that as other than human and, or other than what I know. I'm going to learn from that person. So. Yeah, it, it might be easy for me to say, yeah, just get a sketchbook and go out. I know, I know it takes, it, I cultivated it. I didn't even know I was doing that when I was cultivating it. I just kept at it. And um, does that answer your question, kind of? Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, we have one here. So you use a lot of natural materials in your work. Do you do anything to prepare or preserve them or attempt to preserve them? Yeah. And in fact, um, when I first went up to the Taubman, the then director looked at it. And it wasn't um, ready yet. I had only finished 10 pieces and said, we'd like to travel this exhibit. Now, that, that didn't work out for a number of reasons. And one reason is she. Uh, went elsewhere, um, but she said, but with all that shaking in a truck, <laughs> would it last? And I thought, oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> and I made sure that it would, things are uh, glued down, um, UV sprayed, as much as humanly possible to make it last. Um, one of the pieces, um, boy, I don't know if I have it. I think I do. Um, I put a few things I didn't use. 
This one. Okay. So I worked with these grasses. Now those are two painted wings of a uh, kestrel done in green. Um, because the point of the, the, I, the idea behind the green fuse and the chapter is that the gr green world is the fuse for all of life. So I made the, the wings green. But those grasses that are wrapped up there, well, they were real grasses and they kept falling apart and kept falling apart. And I thought, I don't want to abandon this idea because I like that, that look and the, the, the way they splay. So I cut them out of Frosted Miler and hand painted every single one of them. Yeah, I mean, um, I wanted to do it. And then, um, so, and the, there's rust down here, you know, all, all different kinds of glues and thinking about what's behind it, what will hold, what might leach into paper. Don't use it if it's just under the paper. You know, 10 years from now, it might leach through. So put a barrier coat over it or use some other kind of glue or sew it. A lot of it is sewn with fishing line. I did my research. Fishing line can last two or 300 years, unfortunately, for ponds and lakes. Um, but at least, and this is under, uh, artwork is generally kept under good conditions, not on ponds and lakes. So uh, the nails are all sewn. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, each thing is thought about in terms of how long it will last. Uh, and you, I, so I did what was humanly possible. <laughs> Does that answer your question? And all this, uh, all, all, just, I'll get to you. All the stains have UV spray on them. So and now University of Virginia is keeping them all under um, lights that are, that, don't have ultraviolet, so um, that's that's very good. So you were going to ask a question. All right, wh one last question. Oh, this woman. Oh. Just curious, what was your greatest happy accident? That's a, a wonderful question. <laughs> My greatest happy accident. Well, writing the book, let me just say, writing the book, one of the greatest revelations to me was how much I enjoyed describing character. Um, and not saying, not, not exactly, not literally just describe, you know, saying this person was this, but like when I have Barry Truitt, who was a little bit gruff with me, pointing with five fingers like this and you know with this big stout hand and all of the things that he could do he was you know uh, uh, he knew about the sea and conservation and the history of the place and all these things all his expertise and I saw it as both a kind of um, boldness in his personality and also expertise. And so I was able to get in character with gestures and dialogue. Dialogue was my biggest game. This book would not be this book if I hadn't thought, oh, um, I don't have to just come out of the narrative and say, Natural bridge is this high and this, you know, I can have the guide say it, you know. And uh, as Bobby knows, I had, I sent, anytime somebody says something, someone who was living, I sent the chapter to them before, um, before anything so that they would approve. If I have them saying something, um, you know, they, I want, I don't want them to see it in the book and go, I didn't say that. Well, Thank you so much for coming out tonight. Yeah, thank you, everyone.